gentlemen, as you see, tonight I'm going to present to you some selections from my Book of the Heaven 11, and it has two portraits on the front. Uh, they are pictures of uh, Catullus and Sappho. Catullus is the Roman invented the Catullic that I will be exhibiting, and uh, Sappho in, uh, created the Sapphic, which will be part two of this uh, two-part introduction, uh, which I'll, the uh, second part I'll do next time. Uh, first of all, I'd like to begin with Catullus. Uh, both of them have this in common, that they contribute to what I call Book of the Heaven 11. Uh, let me explain that. Uh, basically, all it means is that most of the lines, or all of the lines, most of them in Sappho and all of them in Catullus uh, have 11 syllables. One and two and a three and four and five and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. See, they're 11 syllables. And it's not a terribly difficult invention to think of. It's not very different. It has only a tiny difference from Shakespeare's iambic pentameter. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And one and two and three and four and five. Uh, but here we have... One and two and a three. That's that's the trick there. And a three. That's a, a little leap or a hop, skip, jump. That gives a different character to the verse. And I'll show you that right now, okay? Uh, um, by reading, for starters, a poem translated from Catullus. I translated it. It's the most frequently reprinted, probably, of all of his poems in Latin. And... Um, you can see why it helped uh, uh, this rhythm made helped make Catullus uh, one of the very best uh, seller poets in Rome with a best selling rhythm. Listen. Listen, Lesbia, let us live in loving. Rumor spread by the stern old gossip codgers. Let's appraise at the worth of not one penny. Sun may set. And again awake in dawning. We, however, if once our light is guttered, Spend unmoved an eternal night in quiet. Give me kisses a thousand, then a hundred, Then a thousand again, another hundred. One more thousand, and then a final hundred. Lastly, all the thousands having counted, shake the abacus well, erase the number. Thus we're keeping the evil man from envy, who's unable to tally up the kisses. One and two and a three and four and five. And three. Such a joy. Actually, it describes exactly how I felt throughout my honeymoon. And uh, uh, for every poem in this book, there's a, what I call a bagatelle, uh, which is a blog. Not a, I call it. A, I call it a blogatelle. Uh, bagatelle is a French word for a, a, a light piece of music, and I hope they're charming like that. They're certainly melodious, uh, and that I hybridized um, um, bagatelle with blog, and I produced the word blogatelle. Okay, so here's my blogatelle for that poem. Yo, Catullus, I love that rebel spirit. Thirteen lines may approve your lucky winning. Horace told you to seize the moment. Well then, best keep busy of action, be the master. Chronos, time is with Chronos, God defeated. Badly, wrongly confused, they vastly differ. True, the father of Jove is old, bent over, leaning closer to earth the more he's weakened. Time, though, sprightly as Hermes at the seashore, when a lyre from a shell he made and played it, sings to love with the wave spray ever mindful, spree and spraying and spry our lives of mortals, climbing high as the tide in vital triumph. That's a good orientation, nothing like a, a plain example, much superior as an explanatory tool to any amount of theory. And now let me just do a, a half a dozen poems for you, and that'll be a nice introduction. You'll feel what it's like to read this book. New Year's Eve is today. New rhythm beckons. Venture entering waking call, one reckons. Book of Heaven 11, I am starting. Fasten belt for the car is now departing. Cold the morn, though a squirrel soon might waken. 
Only maples are here, no acorn taken, won't, however, imply a disillusion. Finding food, he'll with nature feel a fusion. Thrilling chill of the whiteness deeply falling, classic meter along and wanted calling. Warm companion, abide in lively journey, rival strivers inviting to a tourney. Lady, sing to the life, reborn, awoken. Be our meter a signal and a token, Lord Catullus for gift of this idea. I, homunculus, hear my Galatea. Um, in the blog of tells I explain uh, uh, any mythology I happen to insert, but I'll just tell you very plainly. Uh, homunculus is in uh, Goethe's Faust Part Two. He's a test tube baby, and he breaks open his glass when he sees Galatea, the goddess he's in love with. You'll notice that uh, in that uh, piece I rhymed, and I quite often do. In fact, I would say maybe more often than not in this book. And that, although the Romans didn't rhyme, as far as I can tell, they almost never rhymed anything on purpose. And the Greeks didn't do it either. It's a modern invention, and by modern I mean starting with the Middle Ages. Uh, so um, you can write in uh, without rhymes and be quite catholic if you wish. But I often... Uh, introduce rhymes because I don't believe in avo avoiding. I believe in encouraging every kind of uh, uh, intercultural communication and hybridity. Some hendecasyllabic name our meter. That means 11 syllable in Greek. But I think it sounds to most people more like a pulmonary disease. And so I'm not fond of it. And that's why I re renamed the form Catholic. You rarely find that. In fact, I've only found it once in a translation of a story uh, by Balzac. Some hendecasyllabic name our meter. Sound too cold for a fairer lyric heater. I the heaven eleven coffee offer. Best of swevenly treasures in my coffer. Dactyl, squirrely second unit, sprightly, ludic leap will alert you, smiling brightly, seeking nourishment hid until the winter. Lucky, here is a rhododactyl tinter. Dactyl is the is a rhythm unit or foot called la la la. La la la. That's the thing that distinguishes the catholic. You don't have those in Shakespeare's pentameters. Uh, you do always in in catholics uh and um that's a dactyl means finger uh rhododactyl means rosy fingered as in homer's rosy fingered dawn here is a rhododactyl tinter just means see dawn arising i have an aura that some would call ororo tones are written yet also oral oro Sermonettes may I pen with clever moral, yet attired with adornment warmly floral. Through our January month my morns are maying. Former aunt, to a cricket turned I'm playing, stridulation, cicadas, fiddle bowing. Summer, summer, a singer's seed I'm sowing. Folk will say you are mixing up the seasons. Yes, assuredly fitting, though my reasons. Volatility mooted, have an answer. I through time am a nimble-footed dancer. These were written in January, and I feel like it's springtime. Uh, anything else to say? Oh yes, um, mm, I'm playing uh, a former. I'm a former ant, but now turned to a cricket. I'm playing stridulation, cicada as fiddle bowing. I'm a fiddler, and I'm a violinist, and a choral singer, and a and a folk performer in several traditions. I am a musician, and what I consider most important in poetry, and to be the essence of poetry, is music. Ah, in fact, the next poem is dedicated to my folk music friends. I went to a folk music party, what they call a jam. This is pretty massive jam, uh, uh, several, you know, a couple hundred people maybe. Let me write in the olden Roman manner. All the endings of ancient lines were rhymeless. That which later became the norm our parents knew was only in latter time discovered. Let me tell of the party I attended. Thank you, Tim and Johanna Masters. Winter, 
Skies might darken, but not for true musicians. First the hymns from the Sacred Harp collection sang we through for an hour or so. There followed songs and tunes on the fiddle, apt piano, mandolin and guitar, their contributions added. Oh, and a special treat, nostalgia, deep arose from the items that the sixties quick recalled when we first had shared our favorites. Bold and strange, when intoning gone to glory, overpowering came my strong emotions. I sang this uh, when I first uh, came to Binghamton to get have uh, to carry out my tasks in my new job as a, a, a professor of, uh, at at that time only instructor in English, uh, and uh, I um, uh, I loved going to. We had this, this back in the uh, early 70s, a monthly uh, Binghamton University folk music club, and we'd get together and sing. There was one am amazing woman who came with her seeing eye dog, and she knew ballads that lasted forever. I so much loved them. And so here's Gone to Glory. I'll just give you a bit of it. It suddenly came to me, and, and I, I thought... I. I felt like Wordsworth with his daffodils, much, much younger all of a sudden. I've got a mother gone to glory. I've got a mother gone to glory. Look away over yonder on the golden shore, away up in heaven, away up in heaven. I've got a mother gone to glory. Look away over yonder on the golden shore. It has several verses, but if I were to sing the whole thing for you, we wouldn't get on to uh, the fourth poem. And I'm, uh, I'll only read you maybe this and then another one afterwards. I'd like a short introduction. I want to whet your appetite. This is a very interesting uh, poem because it makes a reference, which I'll explain at the start, uh, to a Persian pub poet of the 14th century, contemporary with Chaucer and with the same rollicking uh, style of life and uh, skeptical mentality as Chaucer had. Uh, this man was named Haf Hafiz, or the Germans pronounce it Hafiz, and I, uh, I'm interested in how the Germans say it because Goethe, Germany's greatest poet and the author of Faust, uh, was so excited w by the uh, Divan, or collection of Hafiz, uh, that had just come out in German, first appearance in any European language, that he wanted himself to be uh, playing the role of a German pub poet. So he wrote a thing called West East Divan, West Östlicher Divan. And I translated the whole thing, and I totally loved the way that uh, uh, Goethe became suddenly a, a Persian pub poet. Anyway, he, he calls Hafiz his twin brother, believe it or not, his twin brother. Uh, and uh, he, uh, so I started to read Hafiz. Uh, I've translated Goethe's Divan, and then I wound up translating 103 poems by Hafiz. I love this whole tradition of, of Sufi Persian language poetry. Anyway, uh, Hafiz has an interesting uh, poem in which he talks about Noah. There are two aspects you may be aware of in the story, Bible story of Noah. He saved uh, pe people from the flood and animals too in his ark, his boat. But on, in addition to that, you know there's a later episode where he uh, is a vineyard uh, grower and he uh, gets drunk and he's found naked. It's a very strange little story. Uh, and um, that is usually not taught to children, as the story of the ark is, but it is part of Noah's characterization in the Bible. Now, how could there be a relation, and what might that relation be, between Noah's activities as uh, a life-giving sailor and Noah's problematic activities as a partying uh, vintner? Hafiz brings them together. He tells you, he has a wonderful sense of humor from my point of view. He tells you, and very happily, having made a great discovery, that Noah had not one ark, but two arks. The, the ark that, he, that saved from the flood, but then there's another ark that saves you from everything, and that is the pocket flask. 
If you just drink from that, uh, you need no other ark. So that comes into this poem here. Almond milk in the cup, a double pleasure, made when added to coffee, which I treasure. Organs warmed and the brain awaked to action. Sing, O psalm of grateful satisfaction. Hafiz, favorite not quite saintly chanter, spoke of wine in a tone of rascal banter. Floods of trouble a Noah boat requiring, pocket flask be the ark of soul desiring. Holy potion to honor God imbibing, rolling tones in a law in a song of laud inscribing. Lift your drink and a visage if you're seeing, toast to life in a tribute hymn of being. I think I will now, let's see. Yes, I'll, I'll turn to this one. Jaunty Jollity. Jaunty Jollity, that's the plan obtaining. No retirement, a fine retoolment gaining. S knew the puberty, seeing height, prevailing, sets the mood. A rewirement I am hailing. Retirement I is a word I've banished, and I a substitute uh, rewirement. And the poet Goethe, whom I've referred to already, had a formula. He lived to be over 80 and, and stayed young. He said I, what, that what he had was uh, repeated puberty. Eine wiederhalte Pubertät. Hidden wisdom attainer, praise eleven. Did I ever tell you what? Why I call this book the Heaven Eleven? It's it's because I'm I'm uh, um, uh, basing the the idea on a uh, mystical interpretation the, in Kabbalah of the fact that there are ten sayings in Genesis where uh, that sound like this: Vayomer Elohim Yehi Or Vayhi Or, and the Lord said. Let there be light, and there was light. This happens ten times. The Lord says something, and it comes into being. So ten is regarded as the number of creation. So then the mystical uh, uh, questioners ask, what is uh, eleven then? Eleven, they decided, is the name of new creation. Nobody knows what that will be. Hidden wisdom attainer, praise eleven. Ten, he says, with the force the Lord in heaven, used for making the universe we're viewing, nature blessing with plenitude enduing. Once the ten are completed, time's awaiting, what with energy clever, unabating, might our mind be amazing. Once eleven comes the heart to awake, through art from Sueven. I use words from all the different centuries of the history of English, and Sweven uh, was the main word, in fact, was the only word for a dream for several centuries until it got pushed away from dream. Dream seems to be related to more violent things, to drum or even to trauma. Uh, but a Sweven, that just rhymes with heaven as well as eleven. What's a poet? The Lord alone can tell us. Ample will to beget, we let impel us. Chant the anthem, the grandest thunder beating, understands when the oversoul tis greeting. Let me conclude there, and thank you so much again. Mm -hmm.